Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. Of course we know that there are no old, bold pilots. But what do we do with one who lives to be old and then decides to get bold? Today we are fortunate to have just such a pilot who has become so bold as to be willing to stand flat-footed in front of this audience and talk about flying the MiG. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to introduce J.B. Brown, president of the National Test Pilot School, who's flown a wide variety of aircraft, and he's an awesome pilot. So let's give him heck. Uh, Cindy, thank you very much. We started uh, this process of me speaking to you guys over a year and a half ago, and then the the nasty uh, COVID showed up and shut everything down and we were having trouble, but uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, and I hope over the next uh, 30, 40 minutes or so that uh, you'll learn a little bit about a couple of, uh, couple of airplanes that dominated the Cold War, at least on the Soviet side. Um, I've been privileged enough to fly both the MiG-21 and the MiG-23. And uh, this briefing was uh, originally put together to uh, educate a bunch of test pilots. So uh, some of this stuff's a little bit technical. I'll try to explain it uh, best I can. I think the good news is every single slide has a picture on it. So if nothing else, the picture to word ratio is about right. Okay. So um, as far as my opportunity to fly these airplanes, uh, the MiG-21, we, we use that at the National Test Pilot School for student projects. The airplane we actually flew for these projects is based in Rockford, Illinois. And uh, we, uh, we give these students uh, a mission set. They say, okay, I want you to evaluate this airplane as far as a day uh, visual interceptor. It's got to be able to climb at this rate, got to be able to cruise so far, landing takeoff performance numbers. And they go out and they fly the airplane to see if it meets these specifications. These specifications we kind of made up. But uh, anyway, it gives the students a good exercise to, to work. Uh, I got involved with the MiG-23 uh, kind of by happenstance or word of mouth. Uh, there's a guy that owned one that was in Sarasota, Florida. He needed to get it to Longview, Texas. And uh, he wasn't qualified in the airplane, whereas I was. So I was the uh, seeing eye qualified pilot as we ferried that airplane to Longview, Texas. And then we did some follow-on testing there. So uh, let's get on with the show. What's the first step you got to do? Well, let's figure out what these airplanes are. And uh, flight manuals are uh, an interesting thing when you deal with Russian airplanes. Um, our uh, source for the flight manuals were declassified CIA machine translations of the, uh, the Russian flight manuals. So, you know, they feed the flight manual into a scanner and a computer translates and spits it back out and what might be considered English, but uh, very, very, uh, you know, the, maybe 80 to 90 percent accuracy of what, it's, uh, what it translates. And then, I don't know if any of you have ever read any Russian translations, but uh, the Russian language is very cumbersome, and they tend to repeat things. They'll put a verb at the beginning, at the end of the sentence, with two or three nouns mixed in the middle, and you're trying to, you know, we're trying to figure out what, what are they talking about. Uh, so, um, a lot of work went into uh, uh, Americanizing these flight manuals uh, so that uh, they were something that a Western pilot would know, understand, read, be able to point to a particular reference if they, uh, if they were looking for it. Um, the, uh, like I said, here's uh, talking about the, taking the, uh, the engine to military power and they take, you know, why use a sentence when a paragraph will do? Right. Uh, for which purpose shift the throttle lever gradually to increase the engine RPM to the maximum value. Um, and they use some different terminology. Maximum is what they would consider full, you know, 100% RPM, full RPM without afterburner. And then they'll use uh, afterburning as their, uh, their phraseology for, uh, for afterburner. Uh, as far as the uh, emergency procedures in these flight manuals, uh, they were organized in a symptom and actions type of format. 
not necessarily step one, two, three, and four that uh, we, we know and love on the western, uh, western side of the world. So the emergency procedures, certainly it took a little work to get that uh, organized. Um, but when you read these flight manuals, you get an excellent insight as to what their philosophy was for using these airplanes. Uh, for the MiG-21, it's obvious that that airplane was going to take off, go into full afterburner, stay in full afterburner, climb to 50, 60,000 feet, track down a B-52, shoot a missile, and land somewhere. Not necessarily at the base that they launched. And their flight manuals are full of uh, unprepared field, soft field uh, procedures. Um, even uh, <clears throat> uh, procedures where the, like the first thousand feet of the runway is paved and the rest of it is uh, sawed or, or whatever. Uh, again, uh, they look at these airplanes as uh, farm implements. You know, they're very rugged, very durable, and uh, we're going to use them. If we lose one, that's all right, because we only built 13,000 MiG-21s. Imagine that, 5,000 MiG-23s. So there's a lot of them out there. If they lose one, they just push the hulk off into the uh, dirt and then uh, continue to operate. Um, for the uh, MiG-21, when it talks about the high fast profile, the MiG-21's a 2.05 Mach airplane. And to do that, you've got to get to relatively high altitude. They routinely flew the airplane with a pressure suit and um, the, if they say it once in the flight manual, they say it three times. Before you select afterburner to go fast, make sure you're pointed toward where you're going to land. Because <laughs> the airplane doesn't have very much fuel. Um, for the MiG-23, uh, the airplane uh, has some nasty handling characteristics at high angles of attack. And uh, here's a quote. It says, the airplane stalls rapidly without warning followed by an unexpected spontaneous spin. So, you know, is this the airplane you want to be dogfighting in, looking over your shoulder and pulling on the stick, and then, bam, she breaks loose, and, uh, and some other nasty things happen in a spin I can talk about later if somebody wants to ask. Uh, so anyway, uh, you, you get a good feel reading these flight manuals. Um, the MiG-21, by the way, uh, the variants that I flew, it's an ADF airplane. The instrument approaches are all fly over the beacon, hack your clock at this speed, fly 30 seconds, start a 180 degree turn, hack your clock again, you know, this, this type of stuff. Um, seems pretty rudimentary, but the way the Soviets operated is the, uh, the altimeter setting they use is QFE, which is zero on the altimeter is field elevation, and they put beacons off the ends of the runways. Every Soviet airfield is the same. And if you're using QFE, they've got one instrument approach plate. Every airfield, the instrument approach into that airfield is the same. Kind of makes sense. I don't know uh, any airline guys here, but you know, keeping the Jefferson charts up to date was a full-time job. Okay. Uh, so ended up uh, editing the flight manuals. Uh, units are an issue. The airplanes are metric airplanes. Um, the ones flying here in the United States, uh, it's mandatory to replace the kilometers per hour airspeed indicator with knots and the uh, metric altimeter with uh, feet. So you've got a flight manual with uh, feet, knots, uh, kilograms per square centimeter for pressure. Uh, meters per second for vertical velocity. So, the, you know, again, there's a uh, mental exercise with the numbers. Uh, ended up editing over 600 pages of text uh, to do this. And like I said, the checklists, they don't have a normal procedure, step one, step two, step three, to start the engines. It's more of this flowing commentary, and you have to extract out of that to get uh, a checklist as we would, we would know it. Also, I found uh, both the uh, MiG-21 and the MiG-23 owners, they had their own little checklist, but they weren't operating the airplane in accordance with the checklist, and the checklist didn't match what was in the flight manual. So it took a little, uh, you know, test pilot love and care to say, hey guys, maybe we ought to operate the airplane the way the Soviets intended and, uh, and go from there. 
Okay, so the MiG-21, uh, the airplane variant in question is the MiG-21UM. Uh, U comes from the Russian word for trainer, M is the Russian word for modified. The MiG-21 uh, began production in like 1958, and if you want to call it, there's three generations, early, middle, and late generation of the MiG-21. Uh, this airplane is the, the middle generation. Uh, our airplane that we have at National Test Pilot School rolled off the factory line in 1972. Um, it's the equivalent of what the NATO fish bed J, and it's got a twin, uh, twin spool after burning turbo jet. There's nothing efficient about this airplane's conversion of jet fuel to thrust. Um, and it's about a 21,000 pound airplane, max, uh, max gross weight. Um, the flight envelope of the airplane, uh, it's good out to 2.05 Mach, 650 knots. Uh, this is straight out of the Russian flight manual, a little hard to read for you. But what's one interesting thing is there's no service ceiling published for the airplane. All they say is above 49,000 feet, you need to treat the engine a little, little more gingerly uh, so that you don't flame out. If you do flame out, the MiG-21 has an engine oxygen system. The bottles on board the airplane for oxygen, so if you do flame the engine out at high altitude, it will inject oxygen into the flow to enrich the, uh, the oxygen so you can get the uh, engine to relight. Pretty, uh, pretty slick. It's a 7G airplane, by the way. Okay, here's the, uh, the cockpit. Uh, what can I say? It's pretty confined. You're in there. Your shoulders are shrugged. It's pretty tight. I'm not a tiny guy to begin with. Uh, visibility out of the airplane is nothing like you would see in a Western fighter. We're all about looking around and checking six and being able to uh, you know, see what's around the airplane. Again, the philosophy of this airplane, you're going full afterburner, you're gonna chase down a B-52, everything's out in front of you, right? Um, they paint the cockpits this green color. It's supposed to be uh, less fatiguing on the eyes of the pilot, uh, you know, more relaxing. Quite frankly, I don't want my fighter pilots to be relaxed, I'd rather be kind of on the edge. Um, and it's a shotgun blast of instruments and switches around the cockpit. Um, they uh, have an interesting philosophy on switches. They double as circuit breakers. So uh, uh, you know, it talks one place, you know, turn on this CB, turn on that switch, but they're talking about the, uh, about the same thing. In the end, with the MiG-21, if all the switches are up or all switches forward, you're ready to go take off and uh, do your job. Um, emergency switches are, tend to be on the left-hand side underneath the throttle over there, so you're still flying the airplane to deal with uh, relighting the engine, uh, things like that. Um, one of the slickest things they have, again, these guys are they're very practical aviators. And I got a picture over here, that's the vertical velocity indicator, the vertical speed, and it's combined with the turn and slip. Why not? Why have two instruments when you, get, you can have one that does, does the jobs? Now, the vertical velocity is calibrated in meters per second. I don't know about you guys, but that pff, kind of blows my mind uh, doing that. The, uh, the instructor pilot in the back has the ability to be a very um, devious individual. He's got switches that will disable the pedostatics. He's got switches that will uh, skew the compass heading. He's got switches that will skew the ADF needle and things like that, give the guy runaway trim. Things like that, you know, so uh, they, they take this uh, very seriously, but uh, uh, we actually ran into a case. We had a GoPro camera mounted on the canopy, and it fell off and hit the turn off the uh, airspeed indicator uh, switch. And, uh, you know, I'm flying around. I think I got a pedostatic failure, and it uh, turned out it was just the switch that had accidentally gotten hit. Um, let's see, what else? There we go. Okay. Um, now, again, as a test pilot, you, you stand back from airplanes, you kind of blur your vision a little bit and look at the bumps and wiggles and the vortex generators and stuff. And that tells you, you get an idea for things that engineers are concerned about. One is the, uh, the throttle in the MiG-21. Let me take you all the way from off to full afterburner. Okay, so you're in off. The throttle locks there. You have to hit a hit a finger lift to get the throttle to come out of off into idle. And then 
you have to push it forward to what's the BLC stuff, that's boundary layer control. That gets enough RPM on the engine to be able to pump air over the flaps for the landing pattern. Then you uh, have what's called rated, which is about 92, 93% RPM. It's kind of a cruise 350 knot, go from point A to point B power setting. Then the airplane will lock the throttle in military power, 100% RPM. Then you have to do another finger lift to go to minimum afterburner. It will lock in minimum afterburner. Then you have to do another finger lift to get it to go into full afterburner, and it will lock in full afterburner. So to go from full afterburner to idle, you've got this whole piccolo drill you know, to get the, uh, the throttle to come on the back, all the way back. What that tells us is they're concerned about the health of the engine and the engine's ability to transition from high power settings to low power settings, afterburner, and et cetera. And in fact, dogfighting the airplane, uh, whatever power, say you're flying along and you get jumped by an adversary, whatever power setting you're at when you get jumped is pretty much where you've got to be for the rest of the fight. Because if you're pulling G, high angle of attack, something like that, you select afterburner, that engine's going to compress or stall and quit, and now you're just a, a, a glider. Uh, the ejection seats, the uh, KM-1, pretty good seat. The Soviets tend to demonstrate it at the Paris Air Show on a regular basis. Um, it's all about the uh, restraint of the pilot uh, during the ejection. Again, it's a high-speed airplane, so we don't want the pilot uh, body parts to be loose in the windstream because uh, flailing injuries, things like that. It's got a very deep head restraint, so when you eject and the airload hits you, your head is locked in there. You're not going to be able to move it around. There are armrests that come down to trap the arms. There, uh, let's see, look at the can cockpit. I don't know if you can see where the legs go into the rudder pedals down there. There's those silver cables looping around. Those cables grab your legs and pull your legs back up against the seat. So you, it wraps you right into that seat. Up the rails you go. Um, it's a five-point harness. It's a, as far as parachute harnesses go, it's pretty comfortable, pretty convenient. And you've got a single, single point. All you got to do is squeeze that little sucker, and, and you're out of the, uh, out of the harness. Uh, ejection sequence is... Uh, there are hand grips between your legs. Uh, down at the bottom of the leg restraints, you can see uh, on either side of the stick uh, those silver diagonal things. That's the top of the hand grips. Squeeze those and pull. Now, on the two-seat airplane, uh, the ejection se sequence is kind of interesting. And it has to be in this sequence and only in this sequence so the whole thing comes to a stop. Front canopy, rear canopy, rear seat, front seat. So if you're flying the two-seat MiG-21 solo, you still have to arm the back seat, because if you haven't armed it, the ejection sequence will stop right there, and uh, you know, you're trying to get out, but nothing's going to happen. Uh, flight control system, the MiG-21, uh, I call it a true hybrid. For uh, the pitch axis, it's uh, nose up, nose down. It's all hydraulics. And it's irreversible. You can't feel the forces. There are springs that uh, they give you a stick force. And trim just moves the, the uh, spring back and forth to where zero force would be. Um, for roll, it's a mechanical system with a, uh, a hydraulic boost, kind of like power steering in your car. And for yaw, it's all mechanical and reversible. The, the rudder is very sensitive. You only have trim in the pitch axis. There's no roll or yaw trim in the airplane. So you hop in the airplane, you fly, what are your impressions? Well, in pitch, the stick forces are very light. The airplane's very sensitive uh, in pitch, but you gotta move the stick a long way, and it's a pretty tall stick. You know, most American airplanes, the stick is lower, so if you're flying formation or something, your, your arm is on, on top of your leg, and you're flying you know, very fine motor control stuff with your, your wrist. Whereas the Soviet airplanes, the sticks tend to be higher, and, and you're, you're stirring this big pot of beans. Um, for a roll with the boost on, the uh, deflection forces are uh, pretty, uh, pretty light, pretty nimble airplane. However, if you turn that boost off, the roll control forces become severe. It takes two hands to roll that airplane left and right, even at low air speeds. Um, in rudder, uh, in yaw, uh, the rudder is very sensitive, and if I've seen a common student error is on their initial takeoff, they got a little roll thing going on and they're playing with the rudders. 
And I have to tell them, just take your feet off the rudder pedals and everything settles down. They tend to uh, get a little wiggly on, on takeoff from that. Uh, get the airplane out to about 350 knots and you don't have enough leg to deflect the rudder full deflection. Uh, the forces get pretty high. But then again, if you're going 350 or faster, what the hell are you doing pushing on the rudders anyway, <laughs> right? Um, taxiing the airplane is not a casual task. You can't really relax. There's no nose wheel steering. Uh, what's interesting about the MiG, it's all about stopping this thing on an icy Siberian runway. It's got anti-skid braking on the nose gear as well as the both mains. It's got a drag chute to uh, slow the airplane down. Big low pressure tires as well. But anyway, uh, taxiing, the way you taxi is you're using the brakes. How do you use the brakes? Well, you see that bicycle handle on the side of the stick? That's what you're doing. The brakes are powered by air. It's a pneumatic system. The air, airplane sounds like a truck. Stuff like that when you're uh, going along. And what you do is you deflect the rudder pedal in the direction you want to go, give it a little brake, and it, what it does is locks that brake on one side and releases the other one, and you can steer the airplane. I found a reasonable technique is on a long straight taxiway, get up to about 40 knots, and you got just enough air over the rudder to, to nudge the airplane left and right, and you're not using your air. Um, by the way, the air system is finite. You pump that up into chocks before you start engines, and that's all the air you're going to have until you shut down. So if you use it all taxiing out, you don't have anything to stop the airplane when you land. Uh, so you've got to be uh, concerned about that. Um, also, uh, if you have a crosswind, the airplane will turn downwind from, uh, from the direction of the cross crosswind on its own. So you've got you to stay in there, you've got to stay concentrated, and you can't really relax while you're taxiing the airplane. Uh, afterburner uh, takeoff, pretty crisp acceleration. Um, you really got to work hard to keep the airplane uh, lined up with the uh, center line as you track down the runway. I'll show you a visu visual uh, or a video here in just a sec. Uh, very large stick uh, deflection, uh, well below rotation speed. The airplane will lift off at about 175 knots, um, but the pitch capture to a, uh, a target pitch attitude and, and all of that's pretty uneventful. The airplane's pretty honest. So let's, uh, this is a uh, takeoff in Rockford, Illinois. Watch all the activity in the rudder there. You'll see a pretty, lot of work going on to just keep the airplane pointed down the runway. Uh, as far as, we call it dynamics, now we're looking at how the airplane flies. You know, people uh, say, uh, hey, the airplane flies great. All right, let's define great. What do you mean by great? <laughs> so we're going to break down the uh, different axes of the airplane and talk about them a little bit. The short period response, that is, you move the stick rapidly to put the nose somewhere, and that's how the airplane responds to that. Um, it's got a relatively high frequency, which means it's responsive, it feels... It flies the way you'd want a fighter to fly, right? You want to put the nose somewhere, it goes right there where you put it. If you move the nose rapidly and let go of the stick, it pretty much stops where, where you put it there. And that's a good, good thing. It, it makes it easier for a guns tracking, missile uh, aiming, things like that. Uh, the fugoid is our long period. That's where you're trimmed up and the airplane slows down a little bit and it'll start downhill and then it'll start coming back uphill and it does this roller coaster thing over typically the period of one of those is a minute or 90 seconds. It's that fighting the trim of the airplane as you're going cross country type of thing. Um, it's convergent, very lightly damped. It'll happily uh, you know, do the roller coaster until you jump in and make it stop. As far as roll goes, the airplane is very, uh, as you might imagine, all the mass of that airplane is in the fuselage. And uh, it's a very rapid roll airplane. Um, I'll show you one here. Uh, this is 90 to 90. And uh, you'll see there's a, a, a distinct overshoot. You know, we almost go 360 degrees. The stick was centered after 90 degrees of roll. That was just all the... Uh, the, uh, the inertia of the, of the thing. Um, and the, uh, the Russians in the flight manual talk about this quite a bit. It's roll-yaw coupling. If you roll one of these airplanes, and this is true of the F-4, the F-5, the F-22, if you take a, a modern fuselage loaded airplane 
and start doing rapid rolls, it'll go out of control after two or three rolls. Um, so uh, the flight manual is limited from 90 to 90 degrees, and that's why that's all you saw in that maneuver. Dutch roll is where, from a gust upset or some sort of disturbance, the airplane wants to, the nose will go one direction and it'll roll back the other way, and it'll do this seasick uh, sailor type of thing. Um, Dutch roll in this airplane is pretty well damped, only two or three overshoots. If you kick the rudder, it'll, it'll stop moving after two or three overshoots. And uh, as you might imagine, with a, I think it's a 68 degree wing sweep, that is a very rolly response. This, uh, this is looking out the left wing tip of the airplane, and all, of, all that was done here was the rudder pedal was pushed one direction, the other direction, and back to neutral. In test pilot lingo, we call that a high feet of beta, which means the airplane rolls a lot more than the nose goes left and right. Okay, uh, high angle of attack in the airplane is pretty interesting. It's a pretty honest airplane. As your angle of attack starts to increase, you get some buffet on the on the thing to let you know that you're making the wings work hard. However, uh, contrasting to the uh, T-38 or the F-5. This buffet, once it starts, is at a constant level. It doesn't increase as you get closer to the stall. So there's no real feeling. You know you're making the airplane work hard, but you don't know you're getting ready to get to a stall angle of attack. Um, first video, if you look over, the, over my left shoulder, you'll see a red light start flashing. That's the stall warning indicator. Um, and. Uh There, it's flashing now just uh, to the left of the center glass. The airplane gets a little bit of a uh, wing rock as it gets close to the stall. And the stick forces tend to lighten up significantly. So uh, there's a, you know, if you're pulling with five pounds of force continuously toward, toward the stall, the airplane's gonna pitch up a lot more with that same five pounds of force. Um, we did find the airplane is what we would defined as extremely susceptible departure. Uh, what you're going to see next is a 1G stall slowing down at one knot per second. The airplane does a little head fake to the left and then a full 360 degree roll. The, I tell you, the stick is centered the whole time as this happens. Probably a transient you don't want to happen close to the ground, right? Uh, also, uh, the, the airplane is, uh, can spin and will spin. They call it inertial rotation, and they guarantee that the engine will flame out if you get into a spin. So not only do you have to recover from the spin with enough altitude to fly, you gotta get the engine started again. Uh, landing the airplane, pretty straightforward. Land a lot like the F-5 or the T-38. Um, come down initial 250, 300 knots. You do a 3G break on downwind. You're about 220 knots or so. Get the first notch of flaps out. And then uh, you're going to come around the base to final turn at about 15 degrees angle of attack uh, with approach flaps. Roll out on final and uh, select full flaps. At that point, the flaps go to their full deflection and boundary layer control kicks in. This is compressed air off of the engine that blows over the flaps to aid in the lift. Um, I didn't find that the airplane flew particularly different with the BLC uh, active, but what happens is you feel this thump and the angle of attack decreases about three degrees, settles in at 12 degrees angle of attack and you just fly 12 degrees angle of attack all the way down to ground impact. I didn't say landing, and I didn't mention flare, did I? Uh, one very important thing with the boundary layer control is if you come over the overrun and you pull a throttle to idle, you've just dumped that air that was blowing over the flaps. You don't have the lift, and the airplane will land right then and there. So uh, you have to maintain power and fly the airplane onto the runway. 
pretty aggressive derotation as the uh, the airplane uh, settles in. Uh, then you got to remember, so you 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 know your throttle is back at BLC stop. That's not idle. You got to pull the throttle back again to get idle power. So as you uh, decelerate on the runway, um, I'm going to show you a video here. This is calm winds, no turbulence. Look at the uh, motion in the stick. If you notice, as he uh, entered ground effect, the stick did come aft as though he was flaring, but the nose didn't move. That was just compensating to hold the nose where, where it was. Um, so to give you a graphic representation of this, I had the uh, back seater tape a big pen to his stick and hold a clipboard with a piece of paper on top. <laughs> and you can see the, uh, the, the stick motion there. So the, Airplane is a bit wobbly. You're, you're in the loop. You're working hard to, uh, to, to fly it. <clears throat> so landing the airplane from the back seat, the good old Russians again came up with a uh, pretty creative uh, way of handling this. As you can tell, there's no visibility out the front. You just can't see past the front cockpit uh, over the nose to land the airplane. Um, so what they did is they uh, put a periscope on the airplane. And when you lower the landing gear, the periscope extends and it, it, it comes down in front of your face right there. I've landed the F-4, the F-15, the F-16 from the back seat, T-38, and the, uh, the MiG-21 was the easiest airplane to land from the back seat of all of them. Because you didn't have to worry with brightness and contrast and stuff like that. You're just looking out the periscope. It's one-to-one. -one. The lighting is perfect. It's what you're looking at out the window. So for the military overhead traffic pattern, you never lose sight of the runway the whole time. Pretty slick. Also, something I wanted to show you was, uh, if you notice on the center of the, uh, the dashboard, there's that white line. This is typical of the Soviet fighters of that era. They tell the pilot, if the airplane's out of control, take the stick, put it on the white line. So now you've got neutral ailerons, full forward stick, which should be a recovery from any out of control situation. Okay, uh, following on on the MIG after the student exercises, uh, National Test Pilot School, uh, we bought an airplane. Uh, and uh, we had had it for a couple of years, but it was in Delaware. We were waiting on getting the, uh, the uh, pyrotechnics for the ejection seats. And at the time we bought the airplanes, about the time that uh, Putin invaded Ukraine and all of the international sanctions and stuff, and I've, I'm not so sure part of it wasn't a uh, Eastern European shakedown, you know, send us more money uh, type of thing. So it took us a long time to get the ejection seats uh, ready for the uh, ferry flight. Ferried the airplane from uh, Wilmington, Delaware to Mojave. Uh, seven flights, 400 miles at a, at a whack, hopping my way across the... Uh, the country. It was in January, so the first step was to get south and then work my way west. Um, let me tell you, you pull up in front of an FBO with a MiG-21, people come out and say hi. <laughs> yeah, they're kind of interested in that thing. Um, and, and by the way, that 400 mile range uh, was with an oversized centerline fuel tank. Without that fuel tank, sitting number one on the runway full of gas, you only have maybe 30 minutes of fuel. It's a very fuel-limited airplane. Um, the second I landed the airplane at uh, Mojave, it was no longer airworthy because I had gone from one FISDO to the other, and it took us about six months to, uh, to get the paperwork so that we could fly the airplane again. Um, so I did the uh, ferry in uh, January, 24th of August. Uh, we got airborne, and... Uh, the intent is to integrate the airplane into the uh, NTPS uh, curriculum, uh, mainly using it for handling qualities, supersonic evaluations, and uh, just to give the pilots 
give the pilots an idea of there's more than one way to skin a cat when it comes to flying an airplane. All right, let's talk about the MiG-23 now. An entirely different machine from the MiG-21. Um, the uh, primary objective of my initial involvement was to get the airplane from Sarasota, Florida to uh, uh, Longview, Texas. And uh, one problem we had was we didn't trust the instruments, so we're not going to go uh, IFR up in the Class Alpha airspace. So we had to stay VFR below 18,000 feet. And also, we did not trust the numbers we saw in the flight manual as far as uh, fuel flow and our cruise performance. So the initial flight between um, uh, Sarasota and Crestview, we, uh, we flew up toward Tallahassee to stay close to the coast, didn't want to go swimming. And then uh, we landed at Crestview and also at the old uh, England Air Force Base in Alexandria, Louisiana. Um, anyway, the first, uh, first thing was, all right, we're going to get to cruise altitude and we're going to figure out our numbers to see what our cruise performance is. And we had a divert option into Tallahassee if, if uh, we found we were short of fuel. Um, this is MiG-23 UB. As I said before, the uh, U is the uh, uh, trainer variant. B is their second one. They go A, B, C, D, just like we do. Two-seat trainer. It's the equivalent of the NATO Flogger C, which was... Uh, not the most capable of the flogger variants as they, uh, they matured through their, their lifestyle. Again, twin spool after burning turbojet, about 22,000 pounds uh, in max AB, and it's a, about a 40,000 pound airplane, uh, you know, full up. Variable wing sweep, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, three basic, the, the wings can actually be placed in any position between full forward and full aft. But there are notches or detents in the control at 16 degrees, 45 degrees, and 72 degrees. Um, so here's a little bit on the flight envelope. It's a 2.35 Mach airplane. Um, I have not flown, I, and I've got 1,000 hours in the F-22. I have not flown an airplane that will accelerate through supersonic like a MiG-23 will. It is uh, quite a powerful machine. Um, once you get the wings swept back to 72, there's just nothing to it, and it's all engine and all thrust. Again, no service ceiling on the airplane, 59,000 feet and above. Eh, take good care of the engine, it might flame out on you. Um, and with the wings all the way back, it's a uh, 7G airplane. Uh, so here's the, uh, the wing sweep control. You can see the detents. Uh, thank goodness the Russians used degrees. So... <laughs> So we didn't have to relabel those, uh, those things. And a little white knob, you just uh, move that where, where you want the wings. Wing 16, take off landing, and if you've got a problem, uh, some sort of emergency, that's typically the first thing you do is get those wings forward. Uh, 45 is the dogfighting, maneuvering, aerobatics uh, position of the wings. 72 is dash. That is uh, light them up, and we're going to get out of here right now. Uh, wing position. So we can uh, watch it. It takes about 30 seconds. See how the camera wiggled right there? That's when the wings started to sweep and it jolted the whole airplane. There's a lot of mass uh, being moved when it goes there. And uh, like I said, it takes about 30 seconds to get the wings uh, all the way back to uh, 72 degrees. <clears throat> And this is the case of the amazing disappearing wing. Just when you think it's going to stop, it just keeps tracking on back. As you might imagine, at each wing sweep position, it's a different airplane. So you imagine what the flight envelope flight test uh, was to, uh, to get that thing sorted out. Also, they, uh, they, they got a problem with directional control with this airplane. And uh, I don't know if they found it in flight test or if they found it in analysis and design before they flew the airplane, but they had to tack on a ventral fin onto the airplane to uh, keep it tracking straight. Uh, the fin is, uh, again, like the periscope in the MiG-21. When you put the landing gear handle up, the fin folds down. When you put the landing gear handle down, it folds back up. And uh, the airplane... Uh, I've had it as fast as 1.5 Mach, and you know, 
At nowhere near 2.35. I don't want to go to 2.35 because at 1.5 Mach, it's kind of snaking around and it's just not very, not very comfortable at all. Uh, the airplane's got uh, speed brakes on the, on the back end. There's four of them that fan out. That's that uh, red, red area there. Real interesting, it's got a maximum speed limit on the speed brakes. Because the uh, fuel tanks are integral into fuselage, there's no uh, bladder or anything like that. If you pull the speed brakes out going too fast, it stretches the fuselage and it will generate fuel leaks at the seams. Now, flight controls, the airplane's uh, hydraulic, mechanical, non-reversible flight control system in pitch and roll. Uh, but uh, the yaw axis, again, the rudder is just all mechanical and you can feel it in your, in your feet. It's got a, uh, what's called a stick force regulator that changes the stick deflections and forces depending on how fast you're going. So, you know, you, you don't want a super twitchy airplane when you're going, you know, Mach 2. You want to, you know, have that uh, toned down. It does have a uh, three-axis stability augmentation system. They call it the damper. And it's got a reasonable autopilot attitude hold. Uh, with control stick steering. It can intercept and fly a, a localizer. Uh, they call it the uh, RSBN. That's their navigation system in this type of airplane. Think of it as a uh, ILS system integrated with a, uh, a VOR DME. So you got bearing and range off of, the, off of the station. It'll also, and the MiG-21 has this too, it's got an unusual, automatic unusual attitude recovery mode. No matter where the airplane is in attitude, Push the button, and the airplane will seek wings level and slight nose high attitude. Um, I haven't tried it in the MiG-23, but I did in the MiG-21. If you're inverted, if you're upside down, it's smart enough to push the nose up while you're rolling to uh, uh, wings level to minimize altitude loss. Uh, there's the uh, MiG-23 cockpit. Guess what? The same baby puke green color. and the. Uh, there's our white line in the middle of the, uh, of the uh, dash. The brakes, are, again, are the, uh, with the, uh, the bicycle grip. Now, looking at this throttle, comparing that to the uh, MiG-21, you can tell they're a little more confident about the operation of the R-29 engine. And all you've got is a uh, finger lift to come out of off into idle, and then uh, min afterburner and max afterburner. So you can move the throttle around without having to do the piccolo drill and uh, the engine will respond just nicely. Again, the two-seat version for training. The instructor in the back can be a pretty devious individual using these controls to uh, disable, skew, modify how the airplane flies for the uh, poor little student up front. Uh, as far as the uh, flight controls, how does it fly? Okay. Um, in pitch, nose up, nose down, I would consider the forces medium. They're not like, like the, uh, the MiG-21. It's not a two-finger touch. It's a grip. And you've got to move the uh, stick quite a bit to get the airplane to move uh, its attitude. Um, also, if you take the stick and you pull it back and let go, it'll go like that. Not a very good dynamic to have uh, designed in your airplane. As far as roll of medium forces and large deflections, again, if the uh, MiG-21 flies like a Porsche, this thing flies like a truck. It really does. Uh, it takes a concerted effort to maneuver it around. Again, shows you what the airplane was designed to force. Whip those wings back, go chase something down, shoot a missile, and go land. Um, the, uh, in, in directional, uh, left and right, you know, in yaw, uh, it takes an exceedingly amount, a large amount of rudder deflection to get the nose to move. Again, with that ventral fin that they engineered on the airplane, you don't engineer that, that stuff just to be cute, right? You got a problem you're trying to solve, and, uh, with the, uh, with the rudder, it takes quite a bit of motion to get the mo nose to move, uh, at all. Uh, taxi the airplane is a lot easier than the MiG-21. It's got nose, nose wheel steering, and you can go to, uh, uh, if you want to call it low and high sensitivity, uh, you, can, you can select, you know, if you're just going to turn around on the uh, hard stand, you can go to high sensitivity, and the airplane turns uh, rather smartly, or you go to low sensitivity if you're heading straight down toward the runway. 
Uh, taxiing from the back seat's a bit of a problem just because of the distortion in the, in the uh, plexiglass of the uh, canopies. For takeoff, you turn the nose wheel steering off. Uh, you select afterburner, it lights right up. There is no nozzle indicator like most Western airplanes. You just get a light that turns on and says afterburner. Um, and then uh, about 130 knots, large stick deflection to rotate the airplane. It gets off the ground 155, 160 knots. You leave it in the afterburner out to about 325 knots. Uh, climb uh, performance, you set the pitch attitude and the airplane just climbs away. Uh, maintaining a target airspeed is not uh, difficult at all. The uh, flight manual calls for a 430 knot climb. You might imagine below 10,000 feet, that could be an issue here in the United States. So uh, our uh, maneuvering speed was 350 knots, so that's what we, uh, we climbed at. Um, brake release to 16,500 feet was about four minutes. Not bad uh, for an airplane. And that was a mill power climb. That wasn't using an afterburner. As far as the dynamics with the wings forward, okay, um, it took a significant amount of stick motion before the nose ever moved. We call that a dead band. You know, it's like a, a steering wheel that's loose, right? You don't, you don't get anything till you've turned a bit, and then all of a sudden it, it kicks in. So that was a little, uh, little disconcerting. Um, also, if you move the stick aft and forward, you you found that you uh, got a uh, bigger response uh, out of the airplane if you're going forward than than uh, nose up. Um, Doing a pulse to see if the nose would uh, bounce around with the damper on, it just stopped where it was, and with the damper off, maybe one overshoot, but uh, still very flyable, not, not objectionable at all. Uh, for roll, if you took the stick and went right, left, back to center, the airplane would yaw to the right. Not sure why that, that is. Now, the MiG-23 uses different controls depending on where the wing sweep is to affect the roll. With the wings forward, it uses spoilers and ailerons together. With the wings at 45, it's using spoilers and differential tail as well as 72 degrees. It's using differential tail to, uh, to roll the airplane. So as far as the Dutch roll, that's this snaky, uh, rolly yawy uh, thing with a damper on. Nothing there, um, but it what well, we would consider over damped. If you got the nose off of uh, going straight ahead and let go, it took four or five seconds for the airplane to come back to, uh, you know, flying straight. That tells you that the directional stability is not very good. Again, another reason why they put that uh, ventral fin on the airplane. Uh, with the damper off, it, it snaked quite well, but in a whole different. Uh, manner than the MiG-21. So the MiG-21 went all roll, right? You saw that? This is the uh, MiG-23. Very slow, very stately. And something about doing flight test in a MiG-23 overhead the Mississippi River, though, I thought was kind of cool. So there, we would call that feet of beta about one. The, the wing kind of moved in a circular fashion, so it, it, the airplane was rolling about as much as it was yawing uh, throughout the whole thing. So we moved the wings back to 45 de degrees sweep. As the wings swept back, the stick moved aft about an inch. And that's how they, uh, they compensate for changes in trim uh, for that. Uh, and no real difference in the, uh, the short period in the pitch uh, um, response, nor in the roll response. It did about the same stuff that it did at wing 16. Uh, with the rudder, uh, again, about the same response, uh, lightly damped with the damper off and the, this circular motion of the wing. Then we move the wings back to 72. Granted, we're only doing 350 knots, and that, that wing sweep, that's a 450, 500 plus knot uh, position. So as we move, move the wings back there, the stick moved a, about another half a centimeter further aft, and um, the airplane picked up a light buffet. There was this tickling buffet uh, on the airframe the whole time we were at 72 degrees. Um, also, the, uh, the stick, you could feel something clamping in to prevent you from moving the stick 
full deflection uh, once the wings got to 72. There's some sort of artificial limiter thrown in there to keep you from spiraling the airplane up. Uh, let's see here. As far as our cruise performance goes, we, uh, we took our numbers on the way into Crestview. The plan was to fly Crestview nonstop to uh, Longview, Texas, and a uh, little bit of math uh, once we got down and, you know, test pilot running that. You know, I got my slide rule out and a piece of graph paper. I'm doing all that flight test stuff, and I'm going, you know, we can't make it to Longview. We're going to have to land somewhere else on the way. So that's how we ended up in uh, Alexandria, Louisiana. But the airplane burns, uh, you know, 42 and a half liters a minute in a cruise configuration. We did not have an external tank on this airplane, but the, the range we derived from our climb, cruise, and descent performance was about 330 to 340 miles. Not very far. So again, this is the operational philosophy. These are point defense, point attack airplanes. They're going to stay close to home. Um, Granted, the MiG-23 can carry up to three external fuel tanks as well. We did not test that. Um, as far as high angle of attack, the flight manual is very clear. I told you earlier, the, the stall occurs without warning, uh, followed by unexpected and spontaneous spin. Uh, so we've got to be very, very careful if we're going to go out there and do, uh, do stall work. It's got a stall warning system that uh, gives you clear indications that you're getting the angle of attack to places you don't want to be. And it also has a stall prevention sti system. It's a uh, stick pusher. I'll show you a vi video of that working. Uh, you got red lights to tell you that uh, you're, you're, uh, you're getting close to the stall and the angle of attack indicator uh, up there with uh, showing you where the angle of attack is. Okay. Uh, on a subsequent campaign, we were doing approaches to stalls, and that, that's where this video comes from. You'll see a somewhat nervous test pilot in the back seat starting to guard the stick here in a second. But you'll, you'll see as the uh, angle of attack increases, the, uh, the stick pounces forward. Y'all see that? See, it, it pumped forward and dropped the nose down. It's about a 40 pound force. If you want to pull through it, it's about 40 pounds. So it's very distinctive uh, indication that your uh, angle of attack is getting too high. Um, with the landing gear down and flaps down and landing configuration, that system is disabled. Which, you don't want a stick pusher uh, operating when you're close to the ground anyway, right? So, uh, you know, you, you're in the flare or something like that. Uh, you don't want it to push the nose over. That, that makes perfect sense. Um, as far as we got in angle of attack, the airplane was very straightforward, controllable in all three axes and forward stick re re resulted in an immediate nose down and reduction of angle of attack. So it was very honest up to a particular point. If you should stall and spin the airplane, um, you got some other problems going on. One, you got to recover the airplane with enough altitude to fly. Uh, the inertial rates of the spin uh, the airplane's very, got a high uh, slenderness ratio. It's very long and skinny, and the engine's the same way. So these inertial rates tend to bend the tube of the engine. Turbine blades start scraping on the uh, side of the case. RPM decays. The fuel, flow, fuel control says, oh, I need more gas. Pumps more gas in there, and what you end up doing is melting your engine down in the spin. So... Now it's not a matter of recovering from the spin, it's a matter of recovering and doing a dead stick landing in an airplane without an engine. So it's stay away from spins. Uh, landing the airplane, uh, downwind about 170 uh, knots or so, four and a half degrees angle of attack, fly final at 155, eight degrees angle of attack, and you flare this airplane and land it like any other airplane, touches down about 140. Uh, in the configuration, we were flying uh, close to sea level, about a 6,500-foot landing roll. Um, the airplane seemed very honest uh, on landing. What you'd never want to do is allow the nose gear to get involved in the initial touchdown because then the airplane will get in this bouncy PIO thing, and after about three bounces, it's just going to go straight in, break you and break it, and cause all sorts of bad things to happen. Uh, brake cooling is an issue. They actually have fans engineered into the hub of the wheels to cool the brakes. But we found a very interesting way. We just took a, a 
garden hose to them. I know all you Western guys are grabbing your chest right now, but these are steel brakes. And the uh, Soviets actually had uh, trenches that they would taxi the airplane through that were full of water to, to cool the brakes. Because if you don't cool them down, you melt down a fuse plug and you end up with a flat tire. Um, so we did some follow-on testing after the, uh, the, cr the cross-country. Uh, we had a leak in the fuel control, so it took him like two years to get that fixed. 2018, we're out there. We're going to start this campaign. We had like four or five flights planned to get finish up his uh, type rating uh, training and get the airplane tested a little bit. So we're sorting out how to do a flame out approach. Is uh, you know it's a basic emergency procedure in a single engine airplane. Uh, we had done one and we found that we were 3,000 feet too low as we came around on the uh, on the final approach. So we aborted that, climbed back up. We added 3,000 feet to the whole problem. Try it again. And as we're about 90 degrees into the turn, he tells me, hey, the engine's not responding to the throttle. So okay, my airplane, I got it. You know, move the throttle, the RPM just stays there. It's decayed down to about 80% uh, on, uh, on the core RPM. EGT is like 300 degrees. So that's not a running thrust producing engine. That's something that, you know, it's flamed out or whatever. Uh, so we ended up doing a engine shutdown and relight as we're turning base to final uh, on the thing. Uh, not the most comfortable of uh, situations, um, but I was kind of happy to, uh, to see this. Luckily, the engine started okay and it responded to the throttle uh, after we went. Longview, Texas, y'all familiar with the place? It's uh, on the eastern edge of Texas, kind of a sleepy hollow uh, thing, but they got a nice 10,500 foot runway out there, uh, so it's good. So we got work left to do on the airplane. Um, the guy was actually able to negotiate with the FAA. He's got his type rating now, so he's able to fly the airplane without my uh, care and loving supervision. Um, and you know, it took a whole new fuel control to the to uh, to get the uh, the engine working properly. <clears throat> there we have it. Any questions for me? <laughs> yes, sir. Um, who? who makes the engines and how reliable are they? Uh, these are Tumansky engines. I would imagine that's at the Tumansky aircraft engine factory somewhere in Russia. Um, they are very reliable engines, however, they are throwaway engines. Uh, typical turbine engine time between overhauls, what, a couple of thousand hours for a Western airplane? Uh, the MiG-21 engine's a 300-hour overhaul engine. And their philosophy is you just yank that engine, send it in, kit and caboodle, you know, with all the uh, accessories, pumps, and all that attached to it. All of that stuff's replaced, and then they throw in, a, throw in the uh, replacement. Yes, sir. No, sir. The, uh, he's asking if the uh, if if you're dogfighting, if the uh, turbine impingement on the uh, engine casing would occur. In a dogfight, the uh, the rates involved are not that high, so you don't have the inertial twisting of the engine. Yes, sir. Yeah, we don't know. Uh, it was only I think to the left, and you'd move the stick over. This is on the ground. You move the stick over and let go, and it would stay over there. Uh, no, I think there's some sort of impingement in the, in the control uh, path of some sort. Uh, the fact that it only did it one way and not the other way tells us that something's weird. Yes, sir. What system do they use to keep the air? Yep, subsonic, it's not a problem. The air is uh, fully breathable by the engines. Uh, now, supersonic, the MiG-21, you can see there in the middle of the picture, that little pointed thing in the middle of the intake, that is a cone that moves out to start choking the flow and set up a system of little shock waves to give su subsonic air to the engine. 
That cone in the MiG-21 uh, starts to program out at Mach 1.5, and at 1.9 Mach, it's fully extended. And that's one of the ground checks you do before you go fly. You run a little sucker out and back in. Uh, the MiG-23, if you, uh, there's a model of one over here. Take a look at it and keep in mind the intakes on an F-4. It's almost a uh, one-for-one copy of the Phantom intake. And when uh, the MiG-23 goes supersonic, the, uh, the intake actually panels in the intake start choking off the flow and closing it. Now on the MiG-23, well, let's, let's go back up to the F-4. The F-4 intake's got a, a vein. You've got the fuselage, and then you've got a vein, and the intake's over here. And in that vein, there are little blades that the Navy put in there to cut the, uh, the fabric of that barrier system on the carrier so that if they went into the barrier, it would cut those web that webbing and allow the back seater's canopy to open and close. This isn't a Navy airplane. It's not designed to go in that web, but the, the Russian design of the intake has those old blades in there. <laughs> Another interesting thing about the MiG-23, and you study that airplane, you can understand their philosophy of the conduct of the great European war that, thank goodness, never happened. The airplane uses F4 tires. The fuel control has a setting for JP4, which is a NATO standard uh, fuel. It uses NATO standard hydraulic fluid, NATO standard uh, electrical connections. The whole idea was go in, kill the people with chemicals or bio or whatever, move in and use the airfield and all those things. The GISH 23 cannon on the uh, MiG-23 can fire our 20 millimeter rounds. Pretty interesting. Yes, sir. Yes, I have flown the uh, MiG-21 in a dogfight scenario. Uh, the main advantage of the MiG-21 in a dogfight scenario is the first initial turn, that first 180 to maybe 360 degrees, it, can out, it could outturn just about anything that we had in the field. After that 180 to 360 degree turn, um, he was depleted in energy to such a point where our airplanes could uh, gain an advantage if they hadn't pooched it already. Um, and I, what I found the biggest advantage of the MiG-21 was its small size. So if you pointed directly, we call it pure pursuit, if you point directly at the adversary and he knows where you are and knows to look for you, he won't see you until you're about a mile and a half away. And if you've got a missile that's got a two-mile range, you know, you've done your damage already before they ever see you. Yes, sir. Maintenance, or maintenance is a challenge. He's asking about what maintenance challenges we have. Um, the uh, basic care and feeding of the airplane, hydraulic fluid, oil, fuel, we have our people at Mojave trained to do that. It's not very difficult. Um, it's a single point refueling on a MiG-21. You open the gas cap, you hold the nozzle there until it fills up, and then you let go, just like a car. Um, we have a, a team of Hungarians that uh, we bring across to do our heavy maintenance. Uh, there's four guys, and between them, they've got like 135 years of MiG-21 experience. And uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty interesting to watch the, them just swarm over the airplane, and you know, there's Hungarian being babbled back and forth, and heads are nodding and stuff, you know, hand gestures and all that. Um, we have a problem with our engine right now, and uh, we want to get the Hungarians here, but COVID has uh, kept everyone at home. So hopefully toward the end of this year, early next year, we'll be able to get them back out to do an engine change for us, and we'll get back to flying. Yes, sir. He's asking if they're aluminum uh, fuselage airplanes as opposed to titanium. They are aluminum airplanes. Uh, the MiG-21 does not have that problem. Now, that max maneuver light on the 106, as I believe, came on like 180 seconds after, maybe three minutes or so, there was a time to it. And the MiG-21 doesn't have enough gas to go that fast for that long. <laughs> yes, sir. How did I get my MiG-23 rating? That's a discussion that we will not have. <laughs> In the back. Uh, the first part was, uh, does the MiG-23 have a drag chute? And yes, it does. Uh, the reason we didn't use it is packing it as a pain and getting it back into the airplanes a pain and we had a 10,000 foot runway to, uh, to slow down on. And what was the second question? 
Which airplane? Okay, are these air engines susceptible to compressor stall? The MiG-21 engine is very susceptible to compressor stall if you're maneuvering it, your high angle of attack or side slip. The lip of that intake, you look at the picture here, it's a very sharp lip and it does not uh, suffer uh, air uh, going in through it other than straight down the, down the tube. It, it causes turbulence and would cause problem with the engine. The MiG-23 engine appears to be relatively compressor stall free, but you can't maneuver the MiG-23 as aggressively as the MiG-21, so it could have a problem. I don't, uh, I don't know of it. Yes, sir. He's asking about, uh, you know, do they crash a lot of them during pilot training and stuff like that? There are MiG-21 strewn all over the world. There's another reason they made 13,000 of them. Um, yeah, it's a single engine airplane too. Yes, sir, in the way back. He's asking about the uh, compressor sections of the engines and uh, the reliability of those. Uh, one thing is the MiG-17, as I understand, is an axial or a uh, centrifugal flow compressor. Whole different technology than the MiG-21 and MiG-23, which are axial flow. Axial flow is your uh, your, your, your veins, your weather veins, right, around the, uh, around the thing. Uh, so it's kind of apples and oranges uh, as far as that goes. Um, I can say this, that the metallurgy in a Russian engine is nowhere near the metallurgy in a Western engine. And that's why they have the very short uh, uh, overhaul times, is you, you see noticeable erosion in the turbine blades uh, on an older engine versus a newer one. It's very obvious that you got an old engine you're looking at. Yes, sir. Uh, right now, the average hours per year is zero because we've got an engine problem. The airplane is, uh, is down. Um, typical sortie in the airplane is about eight-tenths of an hour if you're conservative with the, uh, with the fuel, so uh, not a lot. Um, I was on the cross country, I was pumping about four thousand dollars of gas into the airplane every every flight. It carries uh, twenty eight hundred liters of fuel uh, with that external tank. And uh, oh, interesting! I meant I meant to talk about this earlier. The fuel gauge in the MiG twenty one. They fill it up with gas. The pilot sitting there, and the the maintenance guy says, "Hey, you got twenty eight hundred liters, okay?" And he cranks the fuel gauge up to twenty eight hundred liters. And then what it does is count backwards. It counts fuel consumed all the way down. Now this may seem very uh, crude, very uh, you know, barbaric in a way, but think of the uh, wiring you don't have to put in the airplane. Think of the calibrations you don't have to do. You don't have to worry about probes in your fuel tanks and all of this stuff. So it's very simple and very effective. Uh, also in the 21, uh, when certain fuel tanks empty, you get a light, and you get a light that comes on it indicates that that tank is empty. So you, you do have a feel for how the fuel sequence is going, and you, you can, you know, that light ought to come on at 1,800 liters. If it comes on at 2,500 liters, you know you got some trapped fuel, and you can uh, operate accordingly. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Oh, okay, uh, the first question was uh, trusting the MiG-23 instruments and why we didn't go IFR. Um, one, we didn't have the, all the calibrations for, for, the, uh, for the instruments. Also, the uh, Russian attitude indicator, let me uh, find a picture here. That one's not very good, let me go to the MiG-21. There, there's the MiG-21 attitude indicator. The Russian attitude indicators the little wings inside the uh, attitude indicator move to show bank angle. The horizon is welded to the airplane. As opposed to the horizon moving in a western attitude indicator. And let me tell you, the first time you see this, you know, you're in a bank turn. In the weather, it doesn't really matter. Because you have no, no reference to say, hey, things don't look right. But if you're visual, you're in a 45 degree bank, and you know the horizon is this, and the bank, the horizon in the airplane is that. <laughs> yeah, you, you know something's messed up, but you don't know what it is. It takes a while, to figure it out. Uh, so you know, we we just did not want to take the chance of uh, a violation or a safety incident flying this airplane up in the uh, Class A airspace. 
I have flown the MiG-21 up there. Um, Chicago Center was not exactly happy we were up there, but yeah, we, we survived it. Oh, visibility out of the airplane, um, it's pretty comparable, about the same. They're look forward airplanes, they're offensive in nature, and the ability to check six, uh, look over your shoulders, minimal. Yes, sir. Um, call sign, at National Test Pilot School, we use uh, Tiger call sign. I'm Tiger 3. Um, coming cross country, I was just using the N number. And uh, good ATC stories. Um, a, uh, you know, air traffic control is not used to seeing a 400 knot VFR airplane, I think is probably the biggest thing. A couple of times go, hey, what are you? Okay, I think we're about dried up. Any, any last hits? Yes, sir. Are you able to take off without that afterburner? Yes, you are. The flight manual uh, says you shouldn't do it. Uh, quite by accident, I ended up doing that in Birmingham, Alabama. It was not comfortable, not fun, and I will never do that again. Um, and it had to do with the flaps were set incorrectly. If the flaps are in BLC, if they're full down, afterburner is disabled. It will not light the afterburners. So uh, that's what happened. The flaps were in the wrong position for takeoff, and the afterburner wouldn't light. And like a dummy, I continued the takeoff. And it took, uh, I was on a 10,000 foot runway, it took a good 9,000 feet of it. Uh, yeah, it, then, you know, once I started getting the gear up, once I got the flaps up, all of a sudden she started flying great. But, uh, you know, that, that wasn't very comfortable. Yes, sir. Absolutely. It's, can civilians come watch us fly? You bet. We do not announce it. Yes, yes, we have to do an engine replacement. Uh, uh, if you go to ntps.edu, you can find a phone number, you can call our operations and ask what, what we're flying that day, and uh, my people will tell you. I doubt we'll be flying the MiG-21. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Are, are we considering buying more engines? We'd like to. Uh, are, we, are we considering buying more engines? Um, we would like to. There are not many of them out there. Most of the uh, MiGs, are, they're still being flown by 20 some odd countries around the world right now. But the uh, airplanes of our vintage uh, have been upgraded to a different dash number engine. So finding our particular type of engine is uh, very difficult. We have one identified in Houston, Texas. Uh, we're going to make a play for it here before too long, get that thing to Mojave. Okay, I'm getting to wrap it up. Uh, one more. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, you know, the, the uh, Eastern Bloc pilots aren't used to long duration sorties. After sitting in a KM-1 ejection seat for an hour, you are ready to get out of that KM-1 ejection seat. Co comfort was not one of the design constraints uh, on that thing. Thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation. <laughs>